Hi guys. So today we're going to talk about some questions that I had from some viewers and talk a little bit about my personal life with these questions and uh, answer them the best way I know how. So the first question was, can you describe the feelings of guilt or shame that can accompany dissociative identity disorder and PTSD? And I'm randomly going to answer these. I haven't planned them ahead. I think the hardest is the guilt and shame that you feel on yourself, um, especially for your past memories and wondering what you could have done differently or what you could have did to prevent the abuse from happening. I think that is probably one of the hardest things to deal with, um, especially with shame. You know, you, you question yourself, especially as a child, you're just like, somehow this is my fault. I, I was in the wrong situation at the wrong time, or if I would have had this on or did this or that, or wouldn't have got on that three wheeler and went to the woods or things like that. You literally doubt yourself or question yourself. Um, as far as like friendships and things like that in today's present time, it's very difficult as well to feel shame or guilt when somebody makes you feel like you're not doing enough or you're not valid enough or things like that. It, it makes it difficult. Um, and in this question, she also puts, are people with DID really multiple people? And in an aspect of reality, no, they are separate subconscious pieces of yourself um, that have made a coping mechanism to deal with your emotions and your memories and what it does is just kind of numbs you from what you don't want to remember yet these alternative states take on that memory and especially those emotions and I I think that's probably one of the hardest things with DID is that when you start to go through the healing journey of it and your alters show you the memories you don't know how to react. You don't know what emotion you are supposed to have because you're so brainwashed into pretending to have a different emotion that the abuser taught you to do, that to literally have a real reaction, you kind of start out going, I don't know what to think. I don't know how to act. I don't, I don't know what emotion to feel. But then when you keep going over it and over it in therapy, that emotion comes out with so much power and so much emphasis that it, you actually feel like you're dying. Um, that's how I feel anyway, um, when that happens and the emotion causes so much somatic symptoms and reactions that you just feel like you don't want to go on. And then after a while, once you've gone through it a few times and you collect that memory and that altar starts to be a piece of you and you see their thoughts, their emotions, and you realize they're your own thoughts and own emotions. Again, you go through that trial of, is this me? Did this really happen? How do I deal with this? You know, and you got to process it. And that takes time. My therapist will say, go home and process it. And sometimes processing is probably one of the hardest things I have to do. How was y'all's childhood before being diagnosed? For my childhood, I didn't even know I had dissociative identity disorder. I thought I was just already by the age of five and six-ish. When I started school was probably when I knew I was different. Um, children liked me and then all of a sudden I wouldn't act like myself and the teachers would notice I, I would be different on certain days. Some days I'd be normal. I'd mimic the other children. I would act like them, eat like them, be like them to fit in. But then some of the days where the abuse took place, I would, there was times where I would take my tray and sit in the corner in the lunchroom and eat on the floor, or I would not make eye contact, or I would want to be around the teacher. I'd act more childish than the age of five and six, where I would cling to the teacher you know it there was these odd behaviors that already showed at that time 
but they had no idea what was, they just thought I was a child in need, you know. Um, I can remember when I was very little, there were rats and mice and bees and hornets and all kinds of things in this old house. I remember the old furniture. It was the best that my parents could do, but there were times where the house was cold. You know, we kind of fell asleep where we fell asleep. There was really, I never remember eating at a kitchen table till later in life when my dad would take me to work with him and I'd eat with the other kids that were at this other farm. And it was odd to me. It was odd to me to see a mother hug and kiss their kid. It was odd to me to see them eat at a table. These were things we didn't do at home. There was really not much for coddling. My mother even today is learning to accept hugs, learning to do normal things, but as a child, I just presumed it was, I thought it was weird to see a mother um, kiss and cuddle their kid or or eat at a table or have rules, you know. We just kind of did what we did. We were free-range children, and if you got hurt, you had to clean it up. If you um, broke something, you had to fix it. If you were hungry, you had to feed yourself. These were things that we grew up with and, and thought were aspects of farm children even though it wasn't. So how do you personally cope with challenging moments or triggers related to DID in your daily life? How do you cope with challenges, moments and triggers in DID? Um, I think now I cope pretty well. Back then, give or take maybe three or four years, um, it was a little more intense. Triggers are things that relate to the past for me. So um, one example I can give you, which I've talked about before, is dish soap, Dawn dish soap. I like it. I like using it. But it's also a trigger. Um, my alternative states, my alters, um, some handle it just fine. On the other hand, I do not. The smell and the feeling of soap and doing dishes can trigger me back to a time when Sister Mary, when I would reside at Rita's, um, wanted me to do housework. And and there were other places where this woman would go with us or be with us, um, you know, the neighbors. Or it seemed like we were always moving. Um, it seemed like every time we had a Bible study or get together, it would be in a different location or different house. Um, and it was rightly confusing. <laughs> On to why that was done that way. I, I don't know if they were just hiding because they didn't want to get caught. And there were times where you had to cook, you had to sew, um, make things, uh, do Bible study, odd things like that. And so that followed me. Um, and at the time when I was younger, you know, four or five years ago, I would be doing the dishes and I'd switch. And I didn't know I switched. Um, DID has huge amnesia, amnesic barriers. So when I'd switch, I didn't even know all of a sudden the dishes would be done. And I'd be like, well, I, I don't remember doing them. Oh, well, you know, you just kind of, you get used to that amnesia. But then you're like, I don't like how this feels. Why did I leave? I, rem I remember starting to get ready to do them. And then after a while, after so many times of that happening, you just kind of get used to it and you're just like, whatever. But then to learn about it and to face it more and more when you're taught in therapy was the hardest part because I'd have to keep telling myself, stay. That was my big word, stay. I'd close my eyes and say, stay, stay, because I didn't want to switch. I wanted to get through it. And my therapist helped me to go, okay, you're in the present. Count five things you see, five things you can smell, five things... You can touch, things like that. And I'd also try to process sometimes the memory if it show up. You know, try to remember, okay, yeah, Sister Mary would hit you in the back of the head if you weren't doing them correctly or if you weren't moving fast enough or, or something wasn't clean enough. So you kind of learn to go, okay, this is just a memory. It's triggering, but it's not in the here and now. So you take your time. And okay, maybe I got one or two dishes washed and left, but I'm going to try again. And then I'm going to try again. So it's kind of like that. You, they're challenging moments, 
and their daily life moments. And these are things that a lot of people don't talk about is the daily struggles. Some days I was scared to do certain things. Um, some days I wanted to sleep all day. I didn't want to move. I didn't want to see anything because I knew if I did, I'd leave. But then there were days where I wanted to go out and I wanted to do things and I wanted to work on something. And then you're like, yeah, there's time lost there again. And then you got to put the pieces together. And I think that was the hardest part. Even uh, when I had uh, Michelle Manna come up to do the interview, um, we had gone to these heritage days and I, I knew it was going to happen sooner or later. You can't control it. You have no control over dissociative spells. And I remember excuse me, getting into the car and being aware after it was over. And the first thing I did was go, okay, I got to do what my therapist does. And I go, I got to remember what I can remember. And I remember pieces, but I wasn't fully there. So it was like, I could remember pieces of going with her and Michelle knew something wasn't right. We don't just announce who we are. Um, when, when an alternative state is out, it just happens. And they, you know, if, if Michelle maybe would have asked who was out, she maybe would have answered, but that ain't how it works for us. It's a, it's a hidden shameful disorder. It's a way of coping and getting through something, something triggered us. And it was the fact of going out, I suppose that was an issue. So I had switched and there was pieces I can remember and there's pieces that I can't. It's odd how that works. What bothers you the most about adults and children faking disorders and mocking true sufferer struggles? My biggest issue is making jokes that it can be sexualizing drug usage. Um, the, the, the mocking of it is what bothers me the most. Um, some of them I let go. Some of them, I just can't let go. I think, especially the misinformation, you know something isn't right or they shouldn't even be on, especially TikTok, if they haven't been educated on the disorder per se. Um, the misinformation gets spread so quickly on that media app that within two or three days, something misrepresented can be the truth and they'll believe it. Um, and they'll have thousands and thousands of people believe one thing. Um, I heard one uh, kid say that DID, you can have it without trauma. Um, I've had people comment on my page and say that, you know, um, I shouldn't say that you have to be diagnosed with CPTSD first before you can be diagnosed with DID. And I had to explain that in great detail. Um, and the, you know, what is CPTSD? It's trauma. It's complex trauma. Number two trauma, you know, and I tried to explain that in great detail. That's where the problem comes in because people that don't do the work and they don't stand by these doctors or therapists, um, they can give so much misinformation that, you know, that the misinformation becomes true. Um, it gets to the point where even you can Google and get misinformation. That's why it's so important to stick with legit sites and legit research. Now, this person had another question that said, if someone was found to be making money off of faking mental illness, do you think they should face the same repercussions as those that fake physical illness like cancer? 100%. I think if they are claiming to be disabled and they are using... I, I'll, I'll give an example. I have seen one person who, instead of just making something and selling it as a person like me, I, I make artwork and I'm entitled to sell some of my artwork. But my biggest issue is, is this person was literally selling items. I don't want to go into great detail because I don't, I don't need the, the bull crap. Um, but she's literally selling items claiming that they were made by littles. But that little knew how to run the cash app. That little knew how to collect the money. And to claim something like that is invalidating and immorally wrong. Um, it's basically using DID to collect funds. When I sell my artwork, I don't mention my DID. I don't say, this is done by a DID system. You should buy it. And if they're not diagnosed and faking the mental illness, it's even worse. You know, it's not about... 
Are there famous artists out there that do make paintings and have dissociative identity disorder? Absolutely. And some of them are very well known and they're very good at educating and explaining the disorder in great detail. But when it's made a mockery of is what I have a problem with. Um, when the person... I go into depth when I study on people that display the disorder. I deep dive. And <clears throat> some of the things I see are very inappropriate. The person I was just speaking of, I seen her um, doing ecstasy, talking about doing ecstasy, doing drugs, drinking. So is that what the money's being used for? Because if that's the case, it's not healing you and it's not helping you. Um, the best thing to do is when you do this as well is to have the guidance of a therapist. You know, um, guidance of a therapist is very important in life, especially if you're disabled with a disorder. Um, it makes a big difference on how you do things. And on TikTok, this has gotten so bad to where these people just, they want to make money. So why not claim they have a disorder? It'll get more attention. They'll get more funding. That's what I have a problem with. So this one says, does your number of alters determine the severity of trauma? Probably controversial, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Well, <clears throat> um, I think it can. It depends on how you handle trauma. Each person is individualized to handle trauma a specific way. Um, severity of the trauma can depend. Um, some people can have severe, severe trauma and not even have DID. It depends on how you function, how your brain functions. Um, I think an alter will handle the trauma over and over again, but can an alter make an alter? I believe so. It's usually in polyfragmented DID people. Um, the complexity of the abuse will show medical records, medical history. I'm not saying that they, they might not even have a history, but it definitely will show in their medical records. Um, me, I'm not polyfragmented, but I have a pretty severe severity of abuse. Um, it shows in my medical records. I have scars on my body from uh, abuse. I've had to have reconstructive surgery done in my lower region because of the abuse. Um, so these are things that, you know, your therapist or your physician, which I say link the two together, some people have a problem with that. Some people say you shouldn't have your therapist connected with your medical health care provider. How the hell are you supposed to learn about your trauma if you don't connect your team, I'm just going to state that because I had somebody give me an issue about my doctor going to my stuff with me. But a therapist is vital to help put the pieces of your mind and memories together. Hence your physical aspects to say if something is physical really happening to you or somatic. And that's why, again, I say it is vital that your therapy is based on your personal life, your personal setting. Um, the other thing they asked is, is there a time in your life that living with PTSD or DID has helped you? Yes, through my whole childhood. Um, the DID, which is why a lot of people do not get a diagnosis right away or even know they have it, is because when you're younger, those coping mechanisms of DID are helping you to survive. They're helping you to get through things. So you have no awareness that you have it. Most people do not really notice um, the issue of time loss or even amnesia until probably later in life. Um, the verity of what doctors and research has showed is most people start to notice um, issues between the ages of 20 and 30 years of age. And that is because now that the trauma is gone and their abusers are gone and they're trying to have a normal life, they notice that things ain't going so good. So they start seeing doctors and psychologists and therapists, um, even physical doctors, physicians, because they, they, they don't know what's wrong with them. And the honest truth, I thought I had dementia. I really did. I, I kept thinking brain tumor, something's not right. Why do I keep having these time losses? Why is it when I set something here, it disappears? So those are vital signs of um, issues that something's going on and you got to get checked out. But I've, I've heard of people that have had up to thousands of of alternative states, but we're talking, you know, a woman who was abused from being born all the way till the age of 20, 30 years old. That's understandable and severely abused with pictures of past history, everything. You really can't hide that too easily. So, you know, most people that do talk about like cult abuse, 
80 to 90 percent of them are not real um, due to the fact that they have no research to back them up they do not have anything to show that they have had past trauma most people that talk about something happening being cut off um whatnot or abused in certain ways there's scars left there's images left sometimes your past will follow you i have um, necklaces that came with me images pictures um even some of my religious like the 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 ring um what do you call it uh rosary to hide because you you know in school you can't wear rosaries they see it and they you know so there was a ring rosary you wear a ring and you count the little little things on your finger and i'd hide it in my coat you know i didn't want people to see it in public school so so stuff like that it's can an altar have a physical disability that the body doesn't have yes absolutely um my alternative state 12 which is now integrated with me has had issues of not being able to see not being able to move she could hear but it was due to the trauma of, of constantly being told don't look at me don't look at me you know um and being severely essayed um and so there was times where my therapist had to work with her to help her learn to get over that physical disability but i do want to talk about one thing and that is when people say that their alternative states can have Tourette's. Now Tourette's and autism are a, are a physical disease. So if one has it, they all would have it. It's how it works, okay? Now I'm going to point out when an altar has ticks, they are not ticks, they are flinches. Flinches are flinches to say, like if somebody's gonna hit you, or if somebody's abusing you, can alters have that? Absolutely. And they can display it very quickly. So sometimes I will give you an example. Um, and again, this is my personal opinion and my personal story. Um, in therapy, my therapist has mentioned numerous times of me flinching. Um, she will go to reach for something or scoot her chair back and there will be a, a jolt, okay? I can't, mim you know, it just happens. And these are based off a, a complex post-traumatic stress syndrome symptoms okay so another physical disability is and i don't want to go into too much detail but per se you're in therapy and an alternative state let's go with a child alter um and then they're talking in great detail about their abuse can they have issues of all of a sudden being wet and and i'm not going to go into too much detail but yes and all of a sudden you come to and you're like, okay, this is a problem. Hence the reason why I had worn um, extra protection for when I did go to therapy and I still do uh, because those are what is an automatic body response to what the mind is seeing, okay? So alternative states can have issues like that, especially childlike alters. They can have accidents, they can have uh, disabilities or body changes um these are things that once you start therapy you kind of need to go okay your therapist can say this happened make sure to you know wear this or be prepared for this for an altar to heal they have to keep processing a memory um, and without the process of therapy it doesn't go away it can it can go with you for years and years and years and so it will repeat itself till there's a reaction from the body or the host themselves. Um, but in therapy, a therapist will work with like a child alter to learn to process the memories safely, to earn trust, excuse me. And once that trust is, is given and a child alter starts to feel safe, they will start to show you the memories that they have and you will get your memory back but then you have to process that those things. And then all of a sudden you could have the similar issues that that child alter had. You know, all of a sudden you realize, okay, I messed myself, there's a problem here. Can I run to the bathroom? <laughs> you know, and, and therapists are very understanding about that. Um, most are very patient when it comes to child alters. And that's a process and that's how I, I learned to except my therapist. I had been through numerous amounts of therapists, doctors over the years, and some of them have made some huge mistakes, crossed huge boundaries. 
you know, so that's normal. But I don't go into detail bashing them because one therapist might work for one person and one might for, not work for another. It depends on how you are. Hence the reason why there are different therapists out there. So it doesn't help to bash them unless they cross a boundary that is illegal. You know, then there's a problem. Then something needs to be taken care of. But as far as like personal beliefs, if you don't like a, a certain doctor because of their Christian beliefs or, or because of how they treat, then kindly, quietly step away and find another doctor. Do not bash that doctor based on belief because that doctor might be saving somebody else's life. And for you to, to mock them is not going to help anybody. So... So that's all I have today. I hope you enjoyed the questions and I know I did and you're welcome to ask any questions you like. Um, keep them clean, keep them honest and I'll answer them as honestly as I can. Loves. Bye.